Now, this gives us the general background, I think, in which the new context of interpretation is taking place. It's quite a complicated area of law, and I can't talk about all the cases of importance here. So I'm going to really just look at a couple which, to me, seem to illustrate sharply, bring into clear focus, precisely what is at stake in these new methods of interpretation. So, first case that I want to look at is a case called Pickstone and Freeman's from uh, 1988. I'm not going to tell you a great deal about the law, as I say, the points are rather complicated. I want to just take us to the issues of interpretation that this case and one later case uh, raise. So, in Pickstone and Freeman's, the House of Lords had to interpret Section 1-2 of the Equal Pay Act 1970. The Act had been amended by Parliament to make it coherent with obligations arising under Article 119 of the Treaty of Rome. The key question that the Court had to resolve in this case was whether the amendment of the Act, the British Act that is, the Equal Pay Act, actually did give effect to the obligations under the treaty, to Article 119. Now, in approaching the interpretation of the Equal Pay Act 1970, their lordships in Pickstone and Freeman's make use of a purposive approach. Lord Nichols, for instance, determined that the purpose of the article was twofold. Firstly, to ensure consistency in the legal systems of the member states across the community and to improve working conditions, it's equal pay, remember. These objectives are furthered by a directive, another form of uh, EU law. In other words, this, we've got an article, we've got a directive, they're two forms of EU law. And by European Court of Justice cases that further clarify the precise terms of community law. Now, a problem arises in relation to the, some of the sections of the UK Act because it does not accord with these features of European law. A broad interpretation would have made the law coherent with European law, the UK law coherent with the, uh, the uh, UK, would have made the European law and the British law coherent, but was difficult to actually square with the wording of the Act itself. In other words, we would have to read the UK Act broadly in order to make it consistent with the European law, but this was difficult given the wording in the Act itself, the wording in the UK Act, that is. What, then, should be the correct approach? Only express wording in an Act passed prior to the date when the UK had joined the community would allow a court to conclude that it was not intended to be consistent with European law. The court was justified in a particularly wide departure from the wording of the Act in order to achieve consistency. So this is the key point here. Only express wording in an Act passed prior to the date that the UK had joined the community. In other words, the Equal Pay Act was, it was passed in 1970, the UK joined in 1972. Um, only Express wording in an act passed prior to the date that the UK had joined the community would allow a court to conclude that it was not intended to be consistent with European Union law, EC law. The court was thus justified in a particularly wide departure from the wording of the Act in order to achieve consistency. In other words, what Lord Nichols is saying here, what the court is deciding in Pickstone and Freeman's, is that the, it's open to the court to give a wide departure from the literal meaning of the wording of the Act in order to make it consistent with the terms of European Union law. Now, that's a bold act of interpretation, isn't it? It goes beyond what the Act actually says, and it prefers a wide meaning of those words in order to make the UK law consistent with community law, union law. One other case to take us a little bit further on, because I think it suggests a further step in the development of uh, European interpretation in British law. The case in question here is Litster and Forth Dry Dock Engineering, and it's uh, a case from 1989. In this case, the House of Lords went even further than Pickstone's. The court gave a purposive interpretation to a statutory instrument 
or uh, an actor, a delegated uh, piece of delegated le uh, legislation that concerned rules relating to the transfer of employees' rights in the event of the sale of a business. The court implied words into the terms of the regulation so as to make it compatible with obligations under European law. Lord Oliver provided a useful uh, uh, summary of the way the court had approached this issue of interpretation in Litster. The court must first of all determine the precise nature of the obligations concerned by construing the wording of both the relevant uh, European directive and the interpretation given to that directive by the European Court of Justice. If it can be reasonably construed in such a manner, UK legislation must be purposefully interpreted so as to give effect to European law. This approach can allow the courts to depart from the literal meaning of the words used. So, why am I saying that this case, Litster, is a further step on from Pixto? Well, here we have it. The court can depart from the literal meaning of the words used in the UK statute and can also read words in. They can add words, they can imply words into, in this case, the regulation or the, uh, the UK law in order to make it consistent with UK law. Now, this is, again, I have to stress this, um, it's a long way, isn't it, from literal interpretation, which certainly would not allow words to be added in. Some commentators have suggested that all these cases uh, raise problematic issues, constitutional issues, about what judges are doing. Now, I can't get into these debates, and I sense you already might know where my uh, opinions or sentiments lie here, but the minor, uh, the minimal point I could make is clearly what the judges are doing here is what Parliament has asked them to do. I mean, if we go back to Lord Denning in uh, McCarthy's and Smith, we can see that these uh, techniques, these practices of reading in words or broad interpretation or what have you, follow from the 1972 Act, follow from an Act telling the judges to do this. What, in my opinion, we're looking at is a shift, if you like, in the way that the Constitution works. I can't really say much more about that. If you know anything about UK politics, you'll know that the issue of Europe, both European human rights and the European Union, are, are hot topics in uh, British politics. Who knows whether, uh, if certain people have their way, we would probably withdraw from the European Union. This would obviously impact on this area of law, but this is entirely speculation. Let me just stress what I've been talking about. I've been talking about the way in which the British courts have picked up on and developed European methods of interpretation. Now, just to give us some final point of reference here, I want to at least suggest that this, uh, these practices of Euro European interpretation um, are not open-ended. I want to just draw attention very briefly to the case Grant and South Western Trains, because in this case, the European Court of Justice refused to prohibit discrimination based on sexual orientation. In theory, they might have been able to broaden the terms of Article 119 and the relevant uh, directives in order to counter discrimination based on sexual orientation, in parentheses now. It's interesting that a lot of these cases are around equal pay. Obviously, this case, though, raises the issue not around equal pay between men and women, but discrimination based on sexual orientation. Now, in theory, the ECJ, the European Court of Justice, may, be, may have been able to uh, expand the kind of protection that European law offered uh, in relation to discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation. They, they didn't do so. The ECJ felt that as community law did not recognise homosexual marriage, this issue could only be dealt with at a national level. Now, I think Grant, this case, indicates one extreme constitutional line, if you like, that community law will not cross, and the British courts won't obviously therefore follow the ECJ. I think it's interesting that this does raise this issue of uh, sexual morality. I think the consequences of the ruling in Grant means that while issues of sexual discrimination have frequently formed the basis of these matters of interpretation that we've been thinking about, certainly in uh, McCarthy's and Smith, certainly in Pickstone's, they form the occasion of these debates on the acceptable boundaries of judicial interpretation in the light of European law. The resistance to equal rights for gays and lesbians means that it's unlikely, or at least at this point in time, if we're just referring to Grant and uh, Southwestern trains, it's unlikely that these, if you like, contentious areas will give rise to these acts of bold, bold interpretation. Thank you.